I've been a medical newsletter publisher for over 40 years, so a lot of medical news has crossed my desk. When I came to this town, where I'm living now, I realized there are quite a lot of retired people, and I began to hear more and more about Alzheimer's disease. In fact, uh, my wife's mother and her mother had died of the same problem. I decided I would get myself up to speed with what's going on in research in Alzheimer's, really with no specific purpose in mind except being a better informed uh, member of the medical community. I spent about two years reviewing the medical literature, and what started jumping out at me was the fact that many of the pieces of evidence that were there were quite compatible with an infectious process. So I thought, well, of course, this must have been investigated because millions and millions of dollars have been spent on Alzheimer's research and years and decades. But when I looked up whether or not the infectious angle has been checked out, I was shocked to find there were only a few studies that related to it. Certainly few when compared to the many, many studies of the amyloid plaques and protein tangles in the brain. But when I looked at those uh, studies that had been done, uh, they usually were focused on identifying bacteria or viruses or parasites in the nervous system. There wasn't much further investigation of whether their presence was causing Alzheimer's disease or were they just innocent bystanders who happened to be in the neighborhood when the Alzheimer's brain was examined. So I realized there was a missing link here. Um, I, in, my, in my early career, I'd worked at the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, where it was common to hear about epidemics that were mysterious but were then solved with certain techniques. I wondered if these type of techniques had been used to look at Alzheimer's cases. And it seemed when I did look, they had not yet been used. For example, taking blood samples and studying possible bacteria, antibodies, or antigens in these blood samples over time. The more I looked, the more I found empty spaces as far as detecting the presence of a germ. And I say germ because I want to include bacteria, viruses, parasites, or even some new kind of um, agent that's not yet known. I found that there had not been a very intensive search for these, and th those that had been identified had not been followed through with blood studies and other techniques to see what they were doing. In addition, I found so several very intriguing pieces of evidence. For example, there was a report that people who cared for an, an Alzheimer's patient in their household had six times the Alzheimer's themselves as did people who cared for a non-Alzheimer's patient in their household. Now, if this can be confirmed, and I'm stressing it's just one report so far, but it certainly seems like it could indicate transmission of an infectious agent. Well, did the scientist who reported it mention this? No, no. See, that's not something that people are talking about yet. So what they theorized was that it was the strain of caring for the Alzheimer's patient that rendered the caregiver susceptible themselves to Alzheimer's. So let's see what more research can do to shed light on this question. Now we can give two examples from history that were very productive. First is the human papillomavirus. Yes, it was found in genital areas, but the idea that it was doing anything was ridiculed for years. But now we know that a lot of 
cancers come from the human papillomavirus. And therefore, it was very productive to find that virus at first. And any of you who have a stomach ulcer are surely aware of the work to identify the H. pylori bacteria that cause gastric ulcers. Way back when I went to medical school, it was doctrine that ulcers were caused by stress and the way to cure them was with antacids and rest. Of course, though that was devoutly believed, it turned out to be wrong. There was a germ there the whole time which had escaped detection and finally was brought to light by a couple of persistent scientists in Australia whose early work was ridiculed. So papillomavirus and H. pylori are perfect examples of why an Alzheimer's germ might be out there right now just waiting for proper attention. One of the most intriguing questions about the role of germs in Alzheimer's could be whether we could get the germ into us in early life, but it only shows up years or decades later as what we now call Alzheimer's disease. Is this far-fetched? Well, not exactly, because let's look at the case of syphilis. The disease starts out often in young adults, with a minor sore on the genital area, a slight rash, and then nothing happens. So the person forgets about it, except 10, 20, 30 years later, the germ causes disastrous effects in the brain, which shows up as neurosyphilis, syphilis of the nervous system, especially the brain. You may remember that Winston Churchill's father died of untreated late syphilis. So it is conceivable, although certainly not proven, that an Alzheimer's germ could get into people early in life and only show its devastating effects in their senior years. So to a person with any, um, any prejudice toward infectious disease, as I admit I have, there are several ripe pieces of evidence in the Alzheimer's field that just beg to be investigated. And that's a reason we created the project called Alzheimer's Germ Quest. We shortened it up for our website by saying Alls Germ, A-L-Z, Germ, but the formal name is Alzheimer's Germ Quest Incorporated. Our idea is to offer a challenge award of a million dollars for the scientist who will come forward with persuasive proof that there is an Alzheimer's germ and this is the evidence that it's at work in Alzheimer's disease to produce dire effects. Now I have been asked, well wait a minute, why offer a prize of a million dollars, why don't you just give out a million dollars in research awards. Let me explain that research grants are totally different from challenge awards. You may have heard of challenge awards in the past for such things as first airplane solo flight across the Atlantic. Well, that was a challenge award. The person who flew the plane across the Atlantic got the prize. The sponsor of the prize did not give the money to people to build an airplane or study how pigeons fly. The prize was only given for accomplishing the task. Interestingly enough, our government and several other private organizations are now using challenge awards to get people to pay attention to subjects not, necessary, not necessarily to fund the research but to get them to produce answers with tools or evidence or facilities already at hand. 